Mr. Lyser, would you please lead us in the pledge? Please take your hands off. Please, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We got some seats up front, guys. Left. Young lady, you got to sit up front, just like church, baby. <laughs> To uh, item seven, the public comments section, we do have uh, one person, um, Mr. Craig. Yes. Um, Mike. We do have a. Yes. Wow, look at that. Shut up. I'm probably going to take a chair with that. This is one taking one. Uh, my name is Ricky Craig. Uh, I'm a two awesome enough to pay alumni uh, student past year. Uh, my question is for you guys if I could get your approval, because we're doing a uh, try and raise money. And we were restoring the tractor and stuff, and on the tickets, and it's hopefully going to come down the line. We want to see a future greenhouse. And we started this two years ago, and I don't know if some of you guys are on the board, and Mr. Beaver proposed that budget, and then he kind of went away and kind of fell behind. So we started saving this fund two years ago. So we got some money in there, but we want to raise on and pursue this, and hopefully within six months, to a year that we can have 50, 80, 100,000 dollars in there that we can come back and say, hey, ain't it cost taxpayers money? We got the money here. So I guess that approval, to, can we do that or not? Or? Sure. <clears throat> One of the concerns that Mrs. brought up is where are we going to put it? That was the biggest yeah. building yeah. 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 So we, I don't think the board is against it. It's just a question of where does it accommodate our that's the biggest question. So, in your grand scheme of things, where do you guys want to put this? Well, and that's the thing we got to talk about. And I know we had a good egg advisor, now Mrs. Ailhoff, and then, uh, we've been talking about this. I know she's got some proposals and hopefully get on the board next month, hopefully. And we got some different ideas. And I mean, it's up to you. I mean, there's a couple we can do in the front of school, back of school, or do it all separate between the high school and the middle school. I mean, what I'm, I just want to do is I want to just not saying it's going to go towards the greenhouse, but future. I mean, so because there's a lot of this small community and the community is egg related. And I know we can get a lot of money raised in this thing. So, and the other thing is coming up in with the benefit of uh, Brent Schultz and Kevin Lynn Fall, they want to do the same thing on their poster. They want to donate all that money to the greenhouse too. That's coming up on May 6th. So, just for clarification, um, we got to be very careful that we don't put too much discussion in yeah. the topic that wasn't on the agenda. Mm -hmm. So since it's not on the agenda, you can we can we can move forward in two ways. One, we can put it on the agenda for the December board meeting okay. and have them take an official vote on it, right. or we can say, um, without having to do that, that you doing a fundraiser and putting future expansion of the FFA program, which might include a greenhouse, you can do that without board approval. I think at this point, the latter would be better for you, because then you won't have expanding on the agenda. Okay. I mean, we're, not, we're not against it, don't get yeah. it wrong. Well, no, and I just don't want to go ahead and make the tickets, because I know, like last year when we had uh, Mr. A, when we did a funds, for fundraising, and he just went ahead and said towards Greenhouse, we got a little trouble from a couple of people called P, hey, can't be doing that. So I want permission before I start making up tickets and posters and stuff. So, and 
but that's just the way, of, and I think that's just all it is, is clarification for work. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not saying it's clinical, but hopefully in the future. If your superintendent is okay with it. <laughs> yeah, I think if you put, you know, this is going towards uh, future expansion of all the FFA programs up to including a greenhouse, you can, certainly can do that. Okay. And I, all the more power to you. I would say that you could do that. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we have a plethora of recognition. So before we go on what's in front of you, we do have a special guest here tonight. They're all special guests yes. here, um, <laughs> but one more particular than another, and that is Anne Fahrenholtz is with us tonight, and Mark is, is going to introduce her. Yeah, uh, so this is the new curriculum secretary for uh, yeah, the Three Watson School District, so mm -hmm. just wanted to introduce you if you've got um, anything that you need to be dealing with curriculum assessment, more instruction. Um, she's our, our new person, so uh, anyways. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. So, yes, yeah, more with the face with the name. Yeah, <laughs> face with the name, and, and, and uh, started last week, and uh, we're very happy to have her with us. And I would also say that um, we've moved here to the district office and we put four rows of chairs in and thank goodness we did. Um, and it looks like the, the high school classes have now reintroduced that you have to come to a board meeting and or some type of a civic meeting. Is that correct? Yeah. And so you, you guys are here for, for class. Is this Mr. Kiwani's class? Yeah. And, Ross. and Mr. Ross's class? All right, well, welcome. And I would, um, I would offer that if you ever have any questions or would like further for clarification on this, that myself and or I, I would suspect that almost any one of the board members with a little bit of notice would be more than happy to uh, come in and address your class. So we offer that up to you. Okay. And our fee is really minimal. Anyway. Um, so the recognition that we have in front of us, and this is this is a brainchild from the board, more specifically Mr. Hansen, who asked that we uh, do a little bit better job, if you will, on the recognition and the public relations that we have going on in our district. So this is our um, first or uh, most in-depth staff staff at doing this correctly for you. So in front of you, board members, you have all kinds of stuff, and we send something in the mail excuse me, um, in the board packet, whether it's email or the mail, about some other things that were going on and some highlights of, of positive things. So um, I'm just going to go over these things as quickly as I possibly can, and then at the end, if you have any questions, you certainly you know, feel free to ask. So recognition, we have the manufacturing, KHS manufacturing was recognized in a newsletter called Circuits of Steel, and you can go on the website and you can find that. We don't we weren't able to print it off, but you can go and look at it. Uh, Boya Grant is one of, we, KMS was one of 60 schools nationwide to receive a Boya Grant, and we, if you want to know more about it, um, we made a copy of it in your packet for you. Peer Mentor Grant is, this is the second year we've been doing this, and we partnered with Campbellsport, and we split the $25,000, and you can see that it's used for mentor, mentoring teachers and supporting new teachers. Feel Up to Play 60, once again, if you go on the feeluptoplay60.com website, you can see um, a 45-second video of one of our student advance uh, um, ambassadors, Courtney, I, I'm struggling with her last name, but Courtney is our student that did that, um, and it's awesome. She did the, they did this all across the United States and had them do these. And Courtney's, I feel, was the best. Um, the Farm to School program, you have an update in your packet of information. And you can see that there's about a half a dozen to a dozen things that we're doing. And you can read through those. It specifically talks about the school garden, some of the art classes, and the things going on with Piggly Wrigley, and the, uh, the vegetable of the month, the buff group, which is the best food course. Uh, best for you food force. So all kinds of great things going on if you look to play 60 and then the farm to school program. We had 13 all-conference football selections. Those are on your um, in your packet. 
and we also had, that includes football, volleyball, boys soccer, and girls tennis, so we gave you a list of all of those kids that, um, not only in football, but also in volleyball, boys soccer, and tennis. Um, nine new NHS members, and thanks to Troy and Mary for coming to the ceremony, which took place last week, and I promise not to try to butcher these names too bad. Is it Alyssa Delavec? Is that how you say it? Alyssa? Is it Alyssa? Delavec, Lindsay, Ducharme? Ducharme. 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 Emily Creer, <coughs> Alexandra Krieger, Megan Lutke, Jay Monty, Michael Prochnow, and Serena Vetter, and Lauren Holt. So congratulations to them. In the public relations area, tomorrow at 1040 at the high school, there's a Veterans Day Assembly. I'd also like to mention that I do have the shirt on from the celebration for the 50 year out at Wayne today. And Mrs. Gail Hoffman is fresh off of planting almost 500 tulips out there today. And we had Copper Box come and present a musical lesson to the kids about working hard and staying true to, to what you want to do with your lives. It was a great presentation. Um, and I think they might have even did a little bit of videotaping of people polka dancing. Um, I stayed out of that for <laughs> obvious reasons. Um, so that was really, really good to see. It was a great day today at uh, Wayne. Uh, the musical's coming up uh, very shortly here um, this weekend. And you can see the information on that. So that's on Friday and Saturday. Uh, Key Club Senior Citizen Thanksgiving dinner is coming up on November 15th. That's Saturday from 11 to 12.30. KHS Band and Choir Concert on next Monday night at 7 o'clock. Financial aid presentation is on November 20th. Child Find Screening is on November 21st from 8 to noon. Um, you can look and see what that's all about. Christmas concerts are coming up right around the corner starting with the Keith's Christmas concert on December 1st, and it's the 40th annual to raise money for scholarships for 40 years. That's unbelievable. Um, and then you have the Wayne Christmas concert is on December 4th at 2 and 6 p.m. Also, we have breakfast with Santa on December 6th. We have the Manufacturing Craft Show is on December 6th as well. Um, at the same time that they're doing Santa. And then the KMS band concert is on December 8th at 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, and note that it has to be in the field house because we have so many kids in bands that they don't fit in the auditorium, so we have to do that in the field house. And then the last thing is, is I'll, uh, Mark would like to just talk a little bit about the manufacturing site visits that we did with the staff. Yeah, I'll, actually I'll talk a little bit when, we do, when I do my updates. I'll okay. Start with you, Mr. Schmuzzle. Very good. I can say that uh, I did attend a meeting for the, the County Workforce Alliance and that it was a resounding, positive, valuable experience for not only Kewaskum, but for Slinger and Hartford and West Bend. So it's a great, great initiative that's being done district wide, excuse me, county wide um, for the most part. German County is part of the county, uh, but they are on the southern end and the northern end, the four school districts on this end have partnered together and it's been a great initiative, and it's wonderful to see the school districts working together on such a positive thing with our manufacturing sites. Any questions? Mm -hmm. No, I would, I would say if you, you, mean you don't have little kids anymore, uh, the breakfast with Santa, the, the, the KHS manufacturing, the tribute boards, the metal the pieces of, I'm, I'm calling them artwork. We bought several a couple weeks ago when they had an open house. Um, great Christmas gifts, and really, Beautiful pieces, really well done stuff from our, our class. And I, I saw my son Snapchat. It sounds like they, they killed a shelf. The shelves are stocked. They're ready to go for the holiday season. So, yeah, a lot of great stuff. I'm, I'm excited about what's really going on around here. There's so many positive things across the board. Academics, athletics, grants, uh, 50th anniversaries. It's, we can celebrate those things. So thanks for going through that laundry list. Uh, hopefully it's longer next week or next month. Why not? Yeah. Anyway. All right, we're on to the consent agenda. Take a look at that and see if you have any um, comments or questions on that. Second. Um, this is El Hippen and Marino. 
Just a second. Any discussion? One discussion point Mr. Leiser brought up at the last meeting to see if we had to do it by roll call or if we could do it by voice, if it had anything to pertain to do with uh, some resignations and or hirings because there's a financial part of that and checking with legal counsel, it is okay to do a voice vote on this. So, all in voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. okay. Um, now we're to Mr. Was that also known as the PowerPoint man? Yeah, I know. I just love pictures. I, <laughs> so, I, got, some, I got some good ones on here, too. Um, so yeah, so just uh, quickly a couple of updates on a, on a few different things, um, and uh, one of them is going to be I've got some I've got some pictures from the uh, um, from the, um, the PD day that we had on October twenty fourth too, and um, I've got a little bit of results from some of the surveys that we did with the teachers as well. So just kind of get through that. Um, first of all, just a little update for the literacy project. One of the things that you'll probably notice um, when you go into classrooms um, is that um, you have students who are doing things called um, either word center or sometimes it's called word study or words their way. Um, this is sort of, a, a, and you'll probably see if your parents, um, students coming home with uh, slips of paper that they're sorting. Um, and we've been doing this for the last few years now. And uh, the, uh, the philosophy behind it is moving away from uh, a traditional spelling program where, where students only memorize a certain set of words um, to moving more towards a, a better understanding about how words are spelled, uh, including looking for patterns. Um, so, uh, so for example, they might see the A-T-I-O-N at the end of a word. And so um, when they think about the word connect and they think about the word connection, and they think about how do you use the word connect and how do you use the word connection, what does the A-T-I-O-N ending do to a word when I add it to it, and then um, teaching them strategies about how to spell as opposed to just memorizing specific, um, specific words on a list. So you'll see that uh, when you go into classrooms, especially during their ELA block, uh, students working on that. Uh, math, uh, one of the cool things that um, our, our new math program um, really focuses on is the idea of math talk. And what math talk has to do with is, uh, again, moving beyond just simply memorizing things, but rather a better understanding about why things are the way they are, and then having discussions um, with other students about it, too. So you'll see things like on this, this is just a, a, a bookmark that they put into their math book. Uh, I want to say this was fourth grade. I saw this. But there's math stems like, I agree with because, or I dis disagree with this because, um, this is a good answer because, so it's not all just about the answer itself, but it's about explaining it and, and making sure that students actually understand why they got to that particular answer. So, and then having those really deep, rich conversations with other students about math conversations and math dialogues. Uh, so the KCA had an open house, uh, and so uh, this, is a, this is a shot of uh, the, the greenhouse. We had a student who actually gave us a, a quick tour of the, the, um, the hydroponics that they have there, the aquaponics that they have there. And uh, in this case, I, I want to say those are peppers. Is that right? Yeah. Those of you guys who are gardeners probably recognize that a little bit. Yeah, that's right. Mr. Fisher was on the <laughs> tour with me as well. So very cool. It was great to hear from, from all the students, both uh, the past and the present students at the KCA, uh, and how uh, the KCA is helping them meet their objectives, um, both um, in uh, post-secondary and, and secondary education as well. Um, educator effectiveness. <laughs> so, um, one of the things they're just skeletal. Uh, yes, and deep thought, deep thought about how can we give meaningful feedback to uh, to, to, to teachers. But uh, <laughs> she really didn't want me to use this picture. But I love it. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that we do with educator effectiveness, the new um, evaluation program for teachers, is uh, twice a year, each semester, we do what we call a recalibration. Um, where we get together with the other administrators and um, we take a look at a, a, some sort of uh, like a recorded lesson and then we talk about what are some of the things that we see in it, um, how would we give uh, feedback to that teacher so that it was meaningful for their, um, for their growth uh, as an educator. And so we do that twice a year and what that does is it helps us with our validity and our reliability with our um, teacher evaluation program that we have. So we'll be doing that in the next month or so um, with the admin team. But we do that twice a year. Uh, and then finally, the last thing is the partnership with the Washington um, County Workforce Alliance. Again, those were the, the people that we had partnered with. Um, and beforehand, uh, here's Mr. Schmazel. 
uh, at the front, kind of addressing everybody. And uh, again, just a, a, a big thank you to Mr. Smazel. He was really the workhorse behind this entire day. He, he did pretty much all the work when it came to setting it up, organizing it, partnering it with all the people. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smazel. And um, it, was, it was a fantastic day. Um, there was a lot of really great things that came out of it. We did a, there was a pre and a post survey done with teachers about their perceptions about the manufacturing uh, industry. And so after taking a look at the data from the pre and the post survey and just doing a little bit of um, some comparative data, uh, analyzing those two, um, there was a couple of things that came out. Here's a picture of one of the buses in front of Triton, uh, the, the manufacturer of the Triton trailers. So um, yeah, everybody's really happy as you can see. Uh, so some of the things that came out of it, uh, looking at the two, uh, the two different surveys is that uh, in general, uh, teachers' perceptions of manufacturing changed to the point that they felt like uh, that manufacturing was safer than they had expected, uh, that manufacturing facilities uh, actually offer more advancement opportunities than they thought that they did, uh, that more training was available for employees when they go into manufacturing, uh, which of course kind of deals with that advancement opportunities as well, um, that jobs were more uh, stable than they had thought, and of course the idea that there's actually a lot more, not only right now is there opportunities in manufacturing, but also in the future that there's going to be a, a big demand um, in the state, but also just even our local community that there's going to be a big demand for uh, manufacturing jobs. So, so a lot of really positive things came out of um, that professional development day. Um, really kind of give us an idea of what, what are the skills that manufacturers are looking for, what it means to be career ready. Uh, and again, these are a lot of the skills that, that, that we do focus on in education, uh, accountability, critical thinking, um, being able to read complex documents, uh, informational documents like blueprints and graphs, uh, and then those problem, problem solving skills, especially with, with mathematics. Those were all a lot of the skills that kept coming up over and over again. So that was really kind of cool to see that it, it really reinforces what, what we mean as a district to be college and career ready. So that's it. Uh, I'm, I know. I'm glad we're doing that, but I still, the biggest complaint I hear from my clients is we can't get workers. Yeah. We can't get good workers. We right. can't get trained workers. Yeah. It's the same thing. Sound familiar, Jay? So I think this helps with that perception, and that perception I think translates into the conversations that they have with students and the teaching that goes on in the classroom, just being aware of that. We've already had some really good conversations even at the elementary level about how we report to, to work habits mm -hmm. to parents. So we're kind of having that discussion now, what does that look like on the report card? So you might see some changes in relation directly to some of the work that, that happened on that day. Um, and really what manufacturers and, and, and you know, beyond manufacturers, what people are looking for in the workforce. Is that directive called work as a four letter word? <laughs> I, I, just a thought, <laughs> just a marketing option. There you go, it. I like it, I like it, good choice. So the second step, this is the first step in the process. So the second step in the process is to have the manufacturers actually come and visit our school district. So on December December 17th, from about approximately 10 until 2 p.m., the manufacturers from these sites um, will be coming to Kiwasco and doing a tour of our facilities. So that's something that we have to look forward to, um, them coming to see us on the 17th. Prior to that, they're gonna go see Hartford, Slinger, and West Bend. So they're gonna go see all four of the different uh, high schools and school districts. It will not just be the high school, it will be other parts of our um, campus district. And then the third, uh, the third uh, part of this is to actually get the students out to these manufacturing sites to do field trips out to the different places. The fourth piece, and the one that's a, a little bit of an intangible is, is we'd love to start organizing it for the parents. We'd love to have a parent field trip. Um, and the businesses, the manufacturers, would love to have the parents come out and do a manufacturing field trip for parents. Obviously, the kids can come along with them, you know, to make sure that they don't get lost. Um, but that would be the fourth step, one that we don't have as much control over, obviously. And then the fifth step, I believe it is uh, scheduled for March 19th, 20th, right in that area. Um, we are going to do a countywide college and career fair at the county fair park. And that will be huge. And all our juniors and potentially seniors will be able to attend that. And that, that is something, please encourage parents to get out to see that 
you know, that's where if you can't make it to the, their site, they will be here. You know, some of these presentations, it's not quite like being there, but you might get a lot of great information. So, and students who are here, encourage your parents to come to that college and career fair. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Um, old business. Looking at uh, dates for the January and July uh, school board leadership retreat. Um, Want to address that? Any more depth than that, or just? I think it's self-explanatory. We've talked about it before. This is the timeline we'd like to use. And just uh, reiterate that in July, the reason that we flipped the two, the July 13th is the second Monday that would normally be the board meeting. We'd like to do the retreat that day, so then you can hear about the things budgetarily and wise what we're talking about, so then we could have the board meeting on the 20th, um, so you'd be much more prepared to then uh, um, take a look at the budget materials and, and do whatever approvals that you need to do. That's, that's this upcoming year, correct? Yeah. The fifth is like a month, yeah, two yeah. months from now. But that's, a, that's a new one. Right, um, but that's going to be at our district office. Right now it's at district office. Questions, comments, conflicts? Okay. That's that. On to new business. Mr. Fisher, payroll. Yeah, I'd like to move to approve October payroll of $1,255,274.22. Second. Okay. Second that. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Oh, aye. Oh, sorry, roll call. Item 13C, Mr. Loss. Good evening. I want to spend a little bit of time here this, uh, this evening with you talking about uh, some scheduling options we've been discussing at high school. I uh, kind of alluded to some of this back in the summer when we had a retreat um, and talked about the fact that we'd be coming forward at a later time to give you more concrete uh, information. And so that's the purpose for my presence here tonight is just to talk a little bit about the schedule of the study process that we've done as a faculty over the course of the last year and also to answer any questions that you might have about the process that we've gone through thus far as well as the trimester schedule. So that's the intent here this evening. Um, we'll just kind of some background and contextual you know, information with regards to why we're even talking about this right now. Um, I sat in this very room uh, back in, in uh, May of 2013 when I was hired. Uh, and there were uh, some students who were here at the time to express concern about the change that took place going from the block schedule to the seven period day. And they just experienced that, that change to a seven period day in which they went from having four classes at any given time to seven classes without study halls and the like. And they talked about the stress that was associated with that. That conversation then continued along with faculty uh, during the summer of, of uh, 2013, in which we talked uh, with staff about their perceptions of the seven period day and how that was impacting students. Um, and so we had some conversation about uh, the impact that students had with stress to their schedule, uh, with concerns about uh, limited access to courses because from going from an eight period day to a four or seven period day, they were reduced to 20 credits over the course of their academic career. Um, and obviously that puts our students here in Kiwaska at a competitive disadvantage compared to students in other districts who have eight credit opportunities throughout the course of their high school career or a chance to earn 32 credits. So in essence, our students are a semester behind students or on any credit opportunity with other districts. So we had some conversations about that uh, and, and want to take a look as far as what can we do to try to, to increase the opportunities that are available for the students at Kewaskin High School. Uh, throughout that whole process, one of the things that we discussed, if we were gonna make a change, is number one, it needs to be cost neutral. We understand the implica implications that exist and the restrictions we have in our budget right now. And so any schedule change that we might make needs to be uh, kept at cost neutral. We want to make sure that we provide students greater access to courses than what they currently have, including advanced coursework, uh, to ensure that every student is college and career ready. 
We also want to make sure we can provide timely remediation and also get into greater depth of study and maximize our instructional time. So those were kind of the tenants that we operated under as we're going through this process. And there are various schedules that we considered and looked at uh, just to kind of give you a sense. And this is not an all-inclusive list, but it gives you an idea. We looked at our current seven period day. We looked at an eight period day. We looked at various options of block scheduling that have been used or have not been used here in the past. Blocks with skinnies, hybrids. Uh, the Forest High School has a three by five model that we took a look at and actually gave some very serious consideration to. And we also looked at the trimester. And throughout that conversation, we try to keep in mind, okay, what can we do to make sure we maximize those tentacles tenants that exist uh, along with the cost neutral perspective. To understand where we're at right now, I think it's pretty clear. It's a seven period day. We have, have seven periods of 50 minutes each, so 350 minutes of instructional time throughout the course of the school day. And there's some definite pros and cons associated with that. Um, you know, the, the pro in this case is that you know, there's seven credits available for our students. It provides daily practice because the courses that are year long meet on a daily basis from day one to the end of the school year. Semesterized classes meet every day for uh, approximately uh, 18 weeks. So there's, there's a, a sense of continuity as far as that goes. It's also a very economical schedule from the standpoint of, of staffing and costs along with that. Uh, in terms of some, some drawbacks to it, um, you know, there's extra class changes that take place. You know, we have students that are moving about the building seven times throughout the course of the day. They're carrying seven classes at a time. Only 20 credit opportunities available to our students over the course of four years. And it also means that our staff in the process of going through and presenting his class presentations throughout the course of the day as well. So some pros and cons to that. And the trimester is the one that, that the faculty has landed upon. I want to emphasize that this is something that Again, it's been a conversation over the course of the last year, but it's really been a faculty-driven conversation and a faculty-driven desire. It's certainly not something that I've been like, well, let's go and make this change. Uh, but we've taken a look at various options that exist. The trimester is a little bit different from the standpoint that students would be enrolled in only five classes at any given time, and the year would be broken up into thirds. So those 12-week those trimesters, so to speak, would result in students taking five classes at a time, and class periods would be approximately 70 minutes in length. So we still have that 7, 350 minutes of instruction taking place, uh, as you can see throughout the course of, of the school day. But again, the student responsibility now is, is reduced down to a load of five classes at a time as opposed to seven. So we think that that addresses that particular issue in terms of stress associated with student schedules. Um, in terms of, of pros, obviously the fewer subjects at any given time. Uh, it provides some acceleration and remediation opportunities, which I'll allude to here shortly and show an example of the student schedule in terms of what it could look like. Um, the initial student reaction, and we haven't spent a lot of time talking about this with students, um, but we have uh, informally, you know, talked to a couple of the classes about it, is, you know, they like the idea of having four classes. You know, they express their concerns about the stress associated with those seven classes, um, and, and certainly the opportunity to take additional courses of interest is something that currently does not exist for them. Um, seven and a half credits per year as opposed to seven. So again, we're trying to get that idea of being able to provide students additional credit opportunities above and beyond what they have right now. This will get us back to 30 credits of opportunities for students over the course of their four-year academic career. Um, fewer daily transitions, again, only transitioning between five classes as opposed to seven. And we have <coughs> classes that are longer in duration, which provides a greater depth of study. So we're not talking about classes where we feel like we're in a track meet right now, every 50 minutes where our staff start a class, they get into it, and then we have to start wrapping up before that bell rings. Um, but it's also not too long from the standpoint that we're going for 95 minutes, as was the case in the block. So this seems to be a happy medium with regards to that. There are some cons, as is the case with every schedule. Uh, there's gaps in classes that could exist potentially from trimester one to trimester three. Classes that are currently one credit in length or meet the entire year right now would meet for two of the three trimesters. Classes that are one semester in length right now or half credit would meet for one trimester. So theoretically, it's possible that you could have scheduling situations develop where you could have a class where the first half of the class would meet trimester one and the second half would be trimester two. You could also have a trimester two start and finish in trimester three, but you could also have the, the extreme where you could have a class starting trimester one and then not resume again until, until trimester three. So that gap does potentially exist. I'll show you some data along the lines of that here in a little bit to hopefully uh, address some questions there. There's two class changes that take place in a given year. So instead of moving from class to class at semester, we have classes transition twice from first to second trimester and second to third trimester. And then there's also the possibility, depending upon the area that we're talking about where class sizes may increase, uh, we would expect to see this more so in the elective areas than the core areas. Uh, I don't really anticipate a whole lot of students who are currently taking four credits of English, and you guys can attest to this taking more than four credits of English. 
it's, it's entirely possible they could do that on their own accord, but I don't see our student body flocking to take an extra you know, half or four credit in English class. What I do see is opportunities for them to expand on uh, in courses in areas that they currently don't have access to because of limited you know, time within their current schedule. Okay? All right. So just so that to show that we're not flying on a limb by ourselves here and kind of trip going down uncharted territory, there's a number of schools, and you can see that a lot of this is recent. West De Pere is probably the most prominent school in the state with regards to the duration of, of use of the trimester schedule. They've not now for uh, going on to their 12th year. Uh, but more recently here in the last couple, three years, uh, there's a number of schools that have kind of jumped on board. Some of them locally, uh, Mequon Homestead uh, of Norris Burling, which is going to be part of our new athletic conference center next year, uh, just recently adopted it. Kakana moved towards it this year. Adam Friendship has moved towards it this year. And currently, Wisconsin Rapids uh, is in the process of moving towards it next school year. Uh, they just recently uh, had approval from their school board to move in that direction starting with the next school year. And so it is starting to grow in popularity for some of the reasons I alluded to before. It's economical, it doesn't cost more than the current seven period day, and it provides opportunities for our students that we're also trying to provide to them here as well. Just some quick facts about the trimester itself. It's a seven and a half credit schedule <coughs> format, five classes at any given time for about 70 minutes. Classes would change approximately every 12 weeks. Uh, we have fewer class changes. We have no in in anticipated staffing increases that would occur, so it keeps it at a cost-neutral perspective. Um, gives us a chance for immediate remediation, and again, provides, it, provides us with an extra half credit that we're looking for to make sure we put our, our students on a competitive uh, playing field that's in, in line with that of their peers from other districts around the state. As far as key assets, uh, we try to take a look at what's true about the academic performance of trimester schools. And the schools which I showed to you here before are all schools which have scored high on the state report card. Uh, so they've seen situations where they've either exceeded expectations or in some cases greatly exceeded expectations. So their performance has, has been proven to be solid over the course of uh, their duration. Granted, in, in many cases they haven't been on it very long, so to, to determine or discern the impact that the schedule's had on that academic achievement, it's pretty difficult to do. And I'd be the last person to tell you that there's a perfect schedule, because if there was a perfect schedule, everybody would already be doing it. So this is a situation where we're trying to find what's best for the students here, uh, as opposed to trying to force something that may or may not be uh, in their best interest uh, in terms of academic performance. Um, took a look at what's true about the additional schedule slot for students, also taking a look at the positive impact on school climate. Uh, you know, again, reducing student stress, reducing transitions, longer duration of courses, uh, you know, anytime you can reduce the number of times that students are interacting throughout the course of the hallway, sometimes those behaviors that kind of, uh, you know, come to play, which doesn't happen very often in our school, uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that about our student population in that regard, still it, it helps to reduce, uh, you know, some stress that goes along with that. Um, gives us a chance to embed some guided practice and form assessment within the lessons. You know, again, a 50-minute lesson is pretty tight. It's really difficult to get things accomplished in that short period of time. If you're talking about lab courses, if you're talking about tech ed, tri ed, science, uh, and, and the like, uh, difficult to, to get students into something, work on an activity, and all of a sudden you have to work and start dealing with the cleanup process and how do you go through and form the assess when you're trying to clean up a lab or clean up a shop prior to the next class coming in. So this provides that opportunity. Uh, it also gives us a chance to develop more meaningful relationships from the student teacher perspective because, again, we're with the students for longer periods of time throughout the course of the day. Um, and so we believe that that's a positive thing. That's certainly something other schools who are in the trimester have alluded to uh, as being a positive, uh, positive characteristic. In terms of special considerations, these are some things that have come up. This is not an inclusive list, but obviously we're concerned about the scheduling of advanced placement courses and making sure students who take those courses have the opportunity not only to access more of the classes, but also the ability to make sure they're successful on the AP exams because that's obviously something we are concerned about. Uh, the impact of scheduling music classes, and we involved the music department, Mr. Dahlberg and Mr. Mikkel on this to a large extent, to make sure that uh, they've had all the input they can have with regards to this. And also special consideration scheduling with regards to math and Spanish. And why math and Spanish? Well, because there's concerns about gaps with regards to that trimester schedule, first and third trimester. You know, is there a chance a student could take Spanish 1 as a freshman during trimester 1 and 2 and not see Spanish 2 again until their sophomore year trimesters two and three, so there'd be a year gap. That's a possibility, but it means, means we need to make sure when we're putting the schedule together that we're cognizant of that and try to provide opportunities for kids to make sure that that gap doesn't exist and that that's large duration, that one year duration, uh, and also provide an opportunity to accelerate. So we need to make sure that when we're building the schedule that we take that into consideration and look at how we're gonna place math and Spanish within the matrix 
provide those opportunities and, and minimize the impact that that gap might have. And I'll show you some examples of that here as well as far as what a sample might look like. So again, we've got, we've got our, our three grading terms, about 60 days each. Half a credit every 60 days, or one credit in 120 days. Five periods a day of approximately 70 minutes. Students would be enrolled in five classes per term, and teachers would teach for the five periods for, the, for each term, and ELT would still be maintained at that 35 minutes per day. So we have that flexible time to once again be used to intervene with students, address students who are in need of additional support, those who need extension, and also provide some much needed time to address the five courses that they'd be taking at any given time. As far as a bell schedule, to kind of give you a sense as far as what that might look like, same start and end time uh, is what we would recommend or suggest, and this is again is a draft and it's open for uh, conversation and discussion obviously, um, but you see what's taking place with regards to the courses, ELT, lunch, and the like, uh, and again, you know, it provides uh, you know, an extra, extra minute of passing time would be available within that, but otherwise uh, the impact and the structure of the day stays relatively similar to what we're used to right now. This would be an example of a, a current or a sample schedule for a junior and to kind of give you a sense. One of the things that we talked about was, was the impact of music and I, I alluded to the fact that Mr. Dahlberg and Mr. Bickley and I had some very lengthy conversations about how to approach this. They're very, very adamant about the fact that they want to see the music courses be sustained over the course of the entire year. Um, and, and I tend to agree with that, and that's consistent with what we've seen from most of the other trimester schools. So that's where you see band listed in here as being uh, throughout the course of the entire year. So students would get one and a half credits, uh, you know, of band within the context of the school year. AP government's a one credit class, so you can see how that kind of fits in with that. And then you notice the situation as far as the gap that we alluded to, you've got English 11, there would be a gap, at least the way this schedule's set up, just as an example, but a gap with English 11 chemistry, and then you have your psychology, pre-calculus, personal finance. So that could be, could be what it could look like. It's not to say what, what it will look like, but that's an example of what it could look like, including gaps, including no gaps, just to kind of give you a sense as far as, as, far as that goes. In terms of a sample freshman schedule, again, here's another scenario, but this is where I want to show you the ability for us to go through and, and do some acceleration and also talk about what we could do in terms of remediation, because this, this can address both, both of these issues. We could, we could create a situation, perhaps, where if we knew that we had student interest to want to accelerate, and Spanish is the example I'm using here, where a student could take Spanish one trimesters one and two, and if we knew that they wanted to accelerate, we could start the first half of Spanish two during that last trimester, and that's the reason why it's highlighted in green. So there's a chance then for a student then to take Spanish two third trimester, take the second half of it in the fall of their sophomore year, and then jump right into Spanish three trimesters two and three of that year as well. So there's a chance for us to accelerate the rate which students are moving through these classes if that's something they want to do. That could be beneficial for students who transfer in and want to get caught up if they're behind. Uh, so the opportunity to access, in this case, Spanish, to get students to Spanish five becomes a real possibility for us here you know, at the Austin High School if that's something we choose to do. The other benefit that exists is for remediation. And unfortunately, we have this problem that takes place, but let's say, for example, a student were to fail the first half of algebra, okay? Currently, what happens in, the, in our current seven period day, if a student fails the first semester of algebra, they pretty much drop out of algebra for the rest of the year, and they repeat algebra again as a sophomore, okay? So in this situation, if that were to happen, we could have the situation structured in such a way that we could repeat the first half of algebra one and have a section created during the second trimester, and that way, then they could take the second half of the first half of the course during trimester two, second half during trimester three, and by the time their freshman year is done, they have gotten to a situation where they're back on track. So we're back on pace, and students are not finding themselves a year behind their peers, and that's important. Um, so just some implications here, just to kind of wrap things up. Um, and you've got this information, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going, going through this. Uh, but you know, in terms of frequency of report cards, progress reports, that's all available in your packet, and uh, kind of gives you a sense as far as what that might look like. Minutes of instruction. Uh, in terms of instructional minutes, there's a little bit of a difference there, and I'd be happy to talk about that uh, with, if you'd like. Um, but we think that the, la la the loss of instructional minutes from uh, the transition from semester to trimester could be recouped because we have fewer transitions that take place throughout the course of, of uh, the year. So instead of that start-stop that takes place in a 50-minute period, some of those things would, re would result in us being able to continue activities and not have that start-stop process where we lose transitional time. Our DP hours would not, would not be really impacted at all. We use three DP hours for the year because of the additional minute of passing time, um, because we do suggest an extra minute of passing time with the trimester schedule. But again, we've got a 59-hour cushion currently with DPI hours of instruction, so we're good as far as that goes. 
Um, and then lastly, gap retention analysis. Talked about that analysis between first and second trimester, second and third, <coughs> first and third. And one of the schools in Michigan that's been operating the trimester for quite some time did an analysis of these particular courses to see what was true about students' grades and this percentage takes a look at what's true about students' grades being the same or better from trimester one to trimester two. So for example, U.S. history at this particular school, 65% of students scored the same grade or better in a one to two format, 74% did better in a two to three format, 81% actually did better in a one to three format. So where you think that there might be a, a, a decrease in terms of performance in this one to three situation, in some cases it, it is, in some cases it is not. That's really what it kind of goes to show is the, the, the sequencing of the courses really doesn't have as much to do with student performance as much as it does with the quality of instruction we provide to our kids. And of course, that's something that we already know. And so you know, we continue to focus on that. And with that, I'll leave open up to questions if there are any at this point in time. Can you back it up one slide? Sure. So talk about how the students are getting Well, the ACT testing, at least the way it's structured right now for the state test is March 3rd and 4th, which puts us right around the end of the second trimester. Okay, we're very close to that. Uh, with regards to uh, Aspire testing, that's going to take place uh, right smack dab in the middle of trimester one, and then the spring version of the test would be shortly after the start of trimester three. So do you see any impact based on, and I'm loving the results of the one to three there on some of those, um, do you see any impact moving forward with how some of that could fall? Chemistry, biology, math, English, those types of things? No, because a lot of the testing that we're talking about in terms of ACT, these classes are already well completed by that point in time. I mean, you know, from the standpoint of, of where kids are at in terms of their junior year, we've already got the bulk of the classes that they're going to need taken care of. I think in biology this year, back to the freshman level, the conversations about moving math back here, you know, in the coming coming years, um, you know, I think we're setting our students up very well to be successful because they're already well taking the course work that they need prior to that, prior to that assessment. So that's really, you know, better focused in terms of preparing their students. From an ACT impact, I don't think that would actually be helpful because they'd be nearing the end of the coursework, potentially, for a new class. And that's the same thing with the AP testing as well because, you know, currently, AP classes that last year long, we've taken the test in May, and you let them miss down on five weeks of instruction. Uh, if the AP, AP courses are off for trimester one and trimester two, the AP class will be completely finished prior to that assessment. So there's some benefits associated with that that are currently our AP teachers and AP students don't have access to. If that's the case, then I would I could see a lot of the elective courses fall in the third trimester, just out of necessity to try to front load and keep it back to back. Potentially, it depends upon it depends upon how many AP courses we're talking about. I mean, you know, again, the number of AP courses we have is good for the school or size, but there's other courses within those departments that students take that could be a one, three type of scenario or a two, three scenario. So we have the ability to place the APs one and two, and then build everything else around that. Right. Yeah. You talk about child failing or, or falling behind, like an eligible one. You did bring it up in the second semester. How are you, how are you going to staff that? Because you're not going to have an eligible one every quarter, are you? No, but what we could do is we could build we could build at least one section where we would have students who we plan on taking out for trimester two and trimester three. So we could have some one twos and some two threes, you know, set up. And so if a student is unsuccessful in the first half in that trimester trimester one, there would already be a class available for them. It's already staffed and already planning on running with, you know, a finite group of kids. You know, we're not planning on kids failing, obviously. Right, I mean, I but, but we could we could structure where we have some slots in there so in case we have students who are unsuccessful. We can get in there right away. Can you back up to the slide of the scheduling for the trimester schedule, please? Yeah, which which one? Uh, the one where the period they've got it broken down in three seventy minutes daily. Yep, right there. Yep. So right there on each on the fall, you're looking at five credits. Two and a half credits. Yeah. Each each class, this would just be half a credit. Correct. So that's the two and a half semester would be five and a half. Uh, or no. Two and a half, two and a half, two and a half. So what are we looking at for a total year for, <coughs> for graduation? How many credits? 30. We're going to be at 30. You'll learn 30. You'll learn 30. Right now you're turning 28. But we really only require three credits. Well, we require 
25 is for this year's group, 24. Is that going to change now? We're not recommending that at this point in time, no. Is this going to be a scheduling nightmare for? <laughs> uh, to address that particular issue, no, it's not going to be. And the reason why it's not going to be is because we're working hand in hand with Skyward uh, this year, in fact, starting on Friday, regardless of the schedule that we do. I mean, we're moving forward, but we have to schedule something next year, right? Uh, but working with Skyward hand in hand starting uh, this coming week <coughs> to make sure that the schedule that we're able to, you know, is one that we can build and they can help us, you know, problem solve and publish your issues on the front end of things. So. so, just so the board knows that this is not something we're asking you to vote on tonight. Correct. Um, this is information, and in that we have now 30 days to um, petition, ask, send questions, thoughts. This will be back on the agenda under old business um, in December. And at that time, if the board would feel comfortable um, enough with the information that you've gleaned over the next 30 days, uh, you could potentially uh, make a motion at that time. Can we do the same thing like with some of the common core questions with Mark? Is that we gather those questions and answers and send out to the board? Correct. Great. Right. I think that's going to be. One other thing I was looking at is, as Bill was talking about this was we did have the transition from four to seven, which occurred to a freshman class that was becoming a sophomore class. Those students who were in the block in the freshman year seven period, sophomore, junior, are now seniors. So at least there won't be a double switch on anybody. That was right. one of my concerns. That's what I was getting at too. It's like, if we're gonna do this, let's keep this for a while, because I think one of you talk about stress. I mean, we keep changing our... Yeah, you wanna hear people squat, change something. Well, that's what I'm getting at. That's where you get most of the stress. Even, even if it's better. Yeah, and they don't know it's better, but they're still, you know. Yeah. We, we've, we've talked about a lot of these things, and I think it's a profound statement um, that Bill made that this is a request coming directly from the teachers. This is not, by any shape, form, or fashion, something that was generated by your administration. Um, we are um, listening to them. We understand where they're coming from, and we feel that it is worthy of um, discussion and or changing and Bill has done a good job of, of getting the thoughts put together um, and presenting it. And I just would say that this is something for your information only, so we would ask that you, if you have any questions between now and December 8th, that you send them to us and we will have them fully answered. Um, and keep in mind that uh, this is a request made by the teachers. I'm glad. Just to give you a sense, we, we surveyed the staff on this after lengthy discussion. We surveyed them at that time. There was 85% support for it. We went back and talked about the work that was going to be required of them to make this happen, and, and it's a substantial amount of work on their end. And uh, we voted once again, and they had 88% support. So, so we're going to have 88% of our staff uh, do it. The new schedule, you'll, you'll be able to accumulate 30 credits, but you'll need 25 to graduate. And the only reason I ask that is if we do have a student that is still in, we have to try to get a window of opportunity in there to, to get them to graduate to work with them. Do you think that, I'm just asking, um, that's enough, would be a five credit leeway, more or less what you're telling me? Five for this year's class, but next year it goes to 24 credits for graduation, so it's six credits. Okay, so there would be a bigger window of opportunity. Most well, definitely. And lots of different opportunities. I mean, opportunities to right. I, I, I get this too. What I'm getting at though is, you know, we, we have to. If I don't have an opportunity to pick up that first eligible class, we we have to do something with that. Yeah. Well, even at 25, according to the way it's two and a half per trimester, they have 12 trimesters. If they blow up two of them, they still graduate. Just to put it in perspective. Well, I'm just saying if I'm struggling in a class and I can't get through it, then I got to take that over to something else if there's enough opportunity there to get that required credit done. Oh, I, I, I know what you're saying, but what I'm saying is... Right, I see what you're saying. You can... Two, you could blow two of 12. Right, and exactly. And still get the cap and the gallon and the whole... Right, but you could blow two of 12 that you don't need. What if it's 
but this is the opportunity right, to, right. be right. Able to get this and to be able to move forward instead of just like saying, oh, forget it. That's what I'm getting at. There's still enough opportunity in this to, to get caught up, more or less. And right. This doesn't even address some of the so it's always yeah. And we're not going to probably reinvent the wheel on this. So we'll take a look at the, what those other schools are doing and see how many credits they have for graduation mm -hmm. and probably just cut and paste whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, just being honest. I mean, other people have done this and have gone before us, so we might as well use what they found out. So whether it's 24, 25, or 26, we'll probably <coughs> fall in line with what other school districts are doing. And when you're taking several AP courses, that's really tough. You know, for seven courses during a day, and you have a few, you know, like three AP courses, there's a ton of work with that. So, well, and, yeah. and along those lines, the 4,500, the 4,200 um, teaching minutes, that, that difference is 6.7%. That's three minutes out of a 47 minute class period. I gotta think we lose three minutes between the front end and the back end. So I see what you mean with you don't need as much because you've got the consistent run of time. So Joe, is there concern with the, the retention period? So if I have two classes and turn after three and then it's gas out and turn us and then you know you're probably less education time with the students because you have to um, summarize or build off of what they have done. I think that's what's interesting about their gap analysis is the fact that there really doesn't, there's no discernible evidence that suggests that there's negative impact on a gap that would exist between, let's say, first trimester and third trimester. That was one, was that one sampling? Yeah, it's one sampling. It's, just, it's a sampling of the school that had data on it, you know, that I could actually access. Mm -hmm. The big data really, I mean, the only school I could pull data from from Wisconsin really would be the peer that would be, you know, all valid. Everybody else is just, you know, any time you do a transition, you're going to see, mm -hmm. you know, implementation dip right away before it can actually start to take off. So the peer would be the school that we should pay for it again, with regards to that. And there's similar size to us, so it should be a good center. Yeah. Well, you talked about the stress levels for students in the mm -hmm. seven period day and the crazy track like um, right. situation. I'm assuming that with our teachers, too, we have the same type of stress levels for them trying to prepare for so many classes. So. Talk about how this impacts the teachers from a long-term perspective. I realize that the workload up front here for some of the staff members may be heavier to make the adjustment, but beyond that, once things are settled and in place, does it help our staff? I believe that it does. I, you know, I, I can let I can let Mr. Hendricks, Mr. Trask, speak to it. Uh, Mrs. Owens is here. Mrs. Alhoff is here. I mean, if they want to speak, Bill, to it, we we have the audit report, and so we're going to keep it okay. open just here. I'm just saying that, that we can do that for next time and put that on the agenda. Yeah. <coughs> so yes, I do. I do. To have other people speak. Yeah. But from the standpoint that it's going to put them in a situation where they're responsible for your students and give them time, uh, that obviously is going to have make them more accessible to the students that they do have. Yeah. Okay. Great. Nice work, Phil. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, superintendent's report, Mr. Smazel. Just a couple of things real quickly. Um, the convention, I don't know where they came with this every child every day, um, is uh, the 94 state convention is coming up in January. Um, I put it in your packet, Tracy made copies of all the different sessions. You can see there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, between now and the December board meeting, if you would check your calendars to see if there's one or two or all three days that you can go, that would be great. And we can talk more about that next time. Um, and then the other thing is, is that traditionally, uh, before the December, um, the fourth Tuesday of, of, excuse me, the fourth Tuesday of November, is the final day to post the notice of school board election. So we gave you a copy of what it would look like as of today um, for the notice of board election um, that needs to be posted by the fourth Tuesday of the month, which is. Tuesday, November 25th this year. Next, uh, Ms. Thorson. Good evening. In your business managers, business office, the fact that you've got uh, the financial report, your donation report, the legal costs, and then this month we've given you the calendar for the budget of 2015 16, even though just two weeks ago you 
no budget for 1450. We get to start all over again. Uh, this is a list of the budget tasks broken down by month. Uh, we bring you something official in April with that working budget, but I do never in the dark for keeping the pieces every month. Um, we called it a budget estimate template, and you saw it. As soon as we knew something, we knew something and how it impacted the budget. And then, uh, right now, there's not a lot of dates filled in, but as those dates become available, we'll share those with you. So what you really want to hear is Carrie Ginn from Riley, Penner, and Benton give you a brief and very interesting overview of the audit. So, hopefully you all have had a chance to look through the um, three reports that were sent over to you while back. I will summarize those for you quickly. Um, the first page, which is our audit report, um, an unqualified, unmodified opinion issue, so that's important that they type of opinion you're looking for, so we're saying that the financial statements are fairly presented. Um, there's a couple changes that I'll note right away. We had two prior period adjustments that were made, which means we adjusted where we started at, so it's a change that could have been made last year, but we did not know about. Um, the first one is due to a change in your capitalization policy. Um, we increased to $5,000 the level you were capitalizing equipment at. Um, because of this, we had to write off any items that were under that amount. And so that amounted to $694,000. And then there was another prior period adjustment in the amount of $81,600. Um, this is for some party of fixed asset additions and disposals that were not included on last year's appraisal report. So we had to adjust them this year when they, they showed up on the current year appraisal. Uh, your financial results for the year. Oh, and I should note those only affect the, the first two statements of the government wide. They don't affect your fund statements at all, so it's not going to impact your, um, your fund balance. Uh, operating results the general fund for the year had an increase in its fund balance of $388,900. <coughs> the end of the year with fund balances, a non simple fund balance from the general fund of $216,000. This is equal to the amount of defaid expenses. And then you have an unassigned fund balance of $3,218,000. Um, we have a comparison to your budget. Um, for Fund 10, you expended 98% of your budgeted expenditures, and you received 100% of your budgeted revenue. Uh, for Fund 27, you expended 92% of your budgeted expenditures and received 83% of your budgeted revenue. Um, there's detail in the report on page 30. It shows which individual functions were over budget if you want to see where those all fell. Uh, your debt activity for the year, you made payments on your general obligation bonds of $845,000 for your close the year with a balance of $4,745,000 on the general obligation bonds. Um, you made payments on your promissory note of $290,000, so you ended the year with a balance on those of $2,055,000. And then we also have to show your OPEB liability. And based on the payment that, uh, or the calculation that Gabby had was due, the amount that's reported on your financial statements at the end of the year is a prepayment of $301,000. Um, what this means is that you've paid more over the years than what the actuary has <coughs> determined your um, required annual contribution is. But what the full liability that they've determined to be is $3,515,000. So even though you're showing a prepayment, there really is a liability out there. So we're just we're just ahead of we're ahead of schedule. You're ahead of like the annual payment. Yeah. And then the last couple pages of the report is the single audit reporting, so the grant testing that we have to do. Um, we had one finding this year, and that was for the transportation program. Um, we found that the district was including some students in the zero to two mile category that were not within the hazardous transportation plan area, so we're required to report that. Um, if the student lives within zero to two miles in order to be listed on transportation to aid for them, you have to, they have to live within that plan. Um, so you want to look into that for next year and make sure anyone you're putting in that category is within that area, no within the plan. Um, we also issue a letter, but do you have any questions on the financial statements before I go into You, you talked about the changes in our um, capitalization process, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then you also said something about the, the equipment. So mm -hmm. there were, because we are effectively, we, we accelerated the depreciation on the items that were under five thousand dollars. Then, right. so that doesn't change our fund balance. It, it'll change like 
if you look on page 14 and 15, it'll change that where you combine the whole district together. Okay. But it doesn't change your fund balance for your individual funds. So the general fund doesn't change, your special education fund doesn't change. Um, it's just the, the confusing district-wide statements that we had to add in uh, even a year ago that yes, we required. Where those are the statements that are on full approval, where we show the capital assets, where we show the okay. liability. Okay. I'm hearing you know, a change in our equity from what you right, said. Right, right. Yeah, not in your... How does that not affect the fund balance? Right. It's only on the full approval statements that we have to show. Okay. That is with respect to the cash basis. Okay. Um, and then I guess now on the equipment, there was the equipment that was disposed of that you were not made aware that it was disposed, if I understood you correctly. Right. You get um, a, an appraisal each year yep. to show what the additions were, what's disposed, to make that the depreciation for um, occasionally, there's things during the year that they don't get on that report, either they're not aware of it at the time, or they miss it, and so it shows up on the next report as like a post adjustment. So there are some items in that report this year that were post adjustments. For that year. So there's new assets that you weren't aware of. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I had on the financial side. Anybody else on the financial side? I didn't think so. Okay. Um, we also issued a letter to you, so I'll go through that quick. On um, the first page of it, we have to list any internal control related issues we find. Um, we list out the different kinds, which are clear weaknesses, which are the more severe, and then significant deficiencies, which we still have to make you aware of, which are less severe. Um, we note that we do not have any any uh, internal control deficiencies that we found in the first part of the section under those categories. Um, and then we also have some other matters every year that we um, put in the letter to make you aware of. First one, when we call these two segregation duties, we note that the accounting and reporting is a limited number of individuals. Um, technically, the more you can split up these duties, the better. Um, with a smaller entity, you often can't do that. It's not cost effective to hire enough people to uh, split the duties as much as you should. Um, so you have to make sure that the duties of authorization, record keeping, and custody are split as much as possible. Um, at the time of the audit, the person who's preparing the checks is also reconciling the bank statement. So splitting these two duties would um, greatly increase that because you'd be splitting two of those functions. Have we talked about that before? <laughs> <laughs> We've had the segregation of duties in there. I don't know if we specifically said the bank statement, but that's one thing that would really help segregate that. So why we don't because we don't have enough people to do it. We have a bookkeeper. <laughs> We like to call it the Lone Ranger. <laughs> um, next page, we have a couple other items noted. Um, the first being for student activity accounts, we suggest that um, you review what's in the fund safety and determine if they're properly recorded there. We've got some strict guidelines of what they think should and shouldn't be in there. Um, so this year we suggest to go through that list and see if there's anything in there that really would be more accurately classified among the other funds. <coughs> Um, note the need for a conflict of interest policy. There is actually a state statute that prohibits the district from engaging in contracts over $15,000 um, within any organization in which an officer and or employee has a private interest. Um, in order to ensure compliance, we recommend you adopt a formal policy covering conflict of interest situations. Um, you want to identify any business relationships where you could have a possible issue. Um, a lot of times people have board members or key employees sign off on, on the statement saying there are no no transactions which impact me personally is just so you're covered for this um, this statute. Um, we have another comment for documentation of receipts. Um, there were a number of instances in which funds collected at the various schools were forwarded to the district office for deposit, but the supporting documentation was not included. Um, supporting documentation should be forwarded with the funds for deposit, and the district office employee should verify that the funds that the funds for deposit agree to the supporting documentation. Um, allows for more accurate tracking of all income and cash and checks to strengthen internal controls over those receipts. And then we also know, just because we like to remind you that you should get a new actuarial report, um, the next one you need would be as of July 1st, 2015, which would be used for the fiscal year 2016 budget. The rest of this letter is the standard items which we're required to make the board aware of, so I will go through those quickly. Um, for changes in accounting practices, as I noted, you adopted a new capitalization policy and this is implemented for a of change for the year. Um, most sensitive estimates is the estimate of the fixed asset valuation, which is based on the third party appraisal, and the estimate of the OPED liability, which comes from an, an actuarial appraisal. 
Um, no difficulties in performing the audit, no uncorrected misstatements, no disagreements with management, um, and no other findings to make you aware. Sure. I feel like I do have an update from last year's management letter if you want to know anything that might have changed from there. Yeah, I okay, some things I had on there last year was that we noted that um, the student activity accounts, interest earned, and bank service charges were not being allocated between the various student activity funds. Um, this year those are being allocated. Um, community service fund. Um, last year we noted that there is an allocation of expenditures into the community service fund, but there was not backup available for how that allocation was um, was created. Um, this year the district has methods of allocating expenditures to the funds and the supporting documentation was available for us. And then we also suggested that we adopt a formal capitalization policy last year and we adopted a policy of $5,000. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're all smarter now. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Look at this. Jan just knows. Ms. Chapman. Thank you. So this is the court. You should have all made a new packet. We have a long paper document of uh, the 2014-15 as our enrollment stands right now for special education. So I just presented that. If there's any questions you have, I'm sure you all know what to do. Our enrollment went up a little bit, and our demographics changed. Thank you. Now go. All right, just want to give you guys an update on charter school stuff. Um, on October 28th, we had an off-site training as a staff. We met off-site uh, just because we wanted to get away from the school. We had one day of PD, and we were there for half a day and just to interruption. So we worked to get something off-site, and we actually ended up going to comments they came to let us use the boardroom, and we had a really nice meeting there. It was nice, comfortable, and we got a lot accomplished. We had a video conference with the uh, folks from Wildlands Charter School, who've been working with us. They're our mentors through the Innovative Schools Network. Um, through those guys, Paul and Liz are the two people we're working with. They have just sent a survey to our staff, so we're surveying our staff, and you know, myself included, and just kind of figure out where we're at with charter school stuff and trying to do some strategic planning. So we're going to continue working through that. Um, we had a multi-age, because this year we had the whole multi-age learning stuff going on at Wayne Elementary School. We did a survey of the, of the parents and community to see how their thoughts were on how multi-age was going this year. And then we also, a second half of that survey, <coughs> was about charter school stuff. Um, the feedback on multi-age was very positive, we thought, very good. Charter school information, basically they're looking for more information, which is what we expected. So now we have some baseline data and we know where we need to be working on sharing information. And we just had a website for the IFA Learning is now, you can get to it through the Wayne Elementary School website. Um, for the literacy project, Wayne Elementary School, you know, we're still part of the district, we're doing a literacy project, and that's going very good. We have somebody, Kim Brown, working with us as our consultant, and she's been coming in, and she has multi-age experience, so she's bringing some of that with the literacy project also, and she also has worked with some charter schools, so that's been very helpful. Um, coming up, a couple things coming up, we have the Google Summit, a couple of staff are going to, uh, through Google, it's in the Nettles. <coughs> There's going to be some great stuff going on there. We have a 3-5 cohort going. Those teachers, because all the students in there have been working on the Chromebooks, and they're really good with Google Apps. We had the tour today with some of the old alumni from original Wayne back in 1964 that they came through, and they saw the kids and the stuff they could do on the computer, and they were just kind of blown away uh, <coughs> what they, they could do. And were, some of them were asking the kids if they knew what a rotary phone was. <laughs> they said no clue. <laughs> so, a um, couple other things, we've got two site visits coming up. We're going to Discovery Charter School in Columbus. They've been around for a while. We're going to go see what they're doing. They're more of a green school, so they're doing environmental stuff, but they do a multi-age and a project base. Another one is Quest Elementary School in Griffin, and they received a grant from DPI, so our visit to them, everything's paid for. They have some professional development over the summer that we can go to, and that's all covered to, through their grant. So that'll be nice. Uh, one other 
just kind of paperwork type stuff, non-stock corporation status. We have to have that filed by December 1st. I was just on the phone last week. I should be getting that paper back this week so we can get that signed um, and sent off and we'll be good there. And then the other part of my update is just about the governance board. We've been doing a lot of work trying to recruit really solid people with different skill sets. And all the things that we've been through, and we've talked to many people about uh, charter school governance, it's really important that you have these different skill sets. You don't just want you know, parents or community members. You want to make sure you have people to cover the different skills. So you can see the handouts that Mr. Schmazo handed out for me. Our, we're going to have an eye for learning teacher. It's going to be Angie Peterson. She's going to be a teacher leader. She'll be on the board. Uh, we're going to have a middle school teacher. We thought it would be a good idea to have because one of the first questions we hear from a lot of parents when we start talking about charter school, well, what happens after fifth grade? So we thought it'd be a really good idea to have a middle school teacher on there. We have a homeschool parent that's been involved with the innovation planning all along, and that's Jackie Alice. We have a higher education partner, that's Kristen Fennell. So she's through Marine Park Technical College, and she's the dean of one of their areas. I don't remember which one it is, but she's got some a really strong background. She's actually came to one of our planning committees and met some of those people. Uh, another one for a legal skill set, Deb Striggins, I'm sure you guys are all aware of, longtime community member, kids in the district, but being a lawyer, she'll have that legal skill set. Financial skill set, we have Craig Blazik, who's the vice president of commercial lending. He's going to be coming and joining us, so he'll have that strong financial background. We have a PR and marketing person, that's going to be Marcia Toys. She's going to be a nice connection between the schools and the businesses because she's worked with the Second Chance program. Um, and then we have another one, business partner, is going to be Jason, I put J in there, but Jason Staffing. He is an IT business person. So I think having all the technology background and stuff will be very, that will be a good strength there. Um, and then we have one other, one other position that's going to be somebody who has a child attending the school. Uh, next year and for a few years to come. And we've been talking with Heather about Heather being involved with that. So I guess we're very excited to have Heather on board. Uh, she's got a lot of good experience with the board already. So we're looking at her on the governance board for the charter school going forward. Yeah, and for, some, for everybody to kind of understand, I wish I could wear both hats, but I can't. So ultimately, I have to submit a, res a letter of resignation I feel like, like the charter school is absolutely going the right direction for our whole district, not just for me. We're very excited to have Heather. She's just experienced as she had, and we know she's very committed, passionate about education. Again, like she just said, not just for Wayne or the Icebrook or charter school, but for the whole district and how we can continue to uh, make this a great thing for our whole district. Yeah, I just. People, before you sit in a seat like this, you don't realize how many areas of um, conflicts of interest can be out there. And for me, I've run into several. Um, and so this is one where um, I really truly feel as if um, our middle school can benefit from strategies that are being developed um, at this charter school. And I feel like long term, it's the best thing uh, for our district. I, I think. There are some really great opportunities for students all across the, the board. So um, thanks for the opportunity. But unfortunately, I will be stepping down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I'd like to have more again next month. Keep us seeking every month. It's good for it's good for Wayne, and it's good for the entire district. One, one second. In, in regards to the, the timing, Heather, um, we're aware of the, the sec fourth Tuesday resignation yes. date and how yes. that affects um, the upcoming election, and etc. One thing that we're going to have to think about as an entire group is what's best for the board going forward from a timing standpoint here as far as the person who would be stepping in, if I understand the math right, I think I do, they'd be stepping in and within 30 days they're going to have to make a decision on whether
know that they're going to run for the position or not for the final year and then have to make a decision a year later, are they going to continue on from that standpoint? Um, it's my personal opinion that that's going to be kind of a disjointed situation. Um, so I guess what would like the board's input on what the rest of the board thinks about the timing of that. Do we have someone come on and immediately, hopefully, they're the ones who want to step in and continue? Or do we, do we have, I mean, Craig's been on board, we have about almost a year before the election time. If we have a little, we have a little <coughs> more than that if, with the person who uh, put, in, put on board. We, I think it's good to have seven. I think I, I don't think anyone can disagree with one. Seven. So then I think I'd like some input from the board on, on their feelings on that and your input on well, that as just well. Just to back up a little bit so that everybody's on the same page with what, what you're talking about. So my understanding is that November 25th, which is the last Tuesday of the month, or Tuesday, whatever it is, um, is kind of significant because if I resign, my, my last effective board day is before that. It means that in April of 2015, the voters would get to choose who fills my seat for the remainder of my seat. If I were to put an effective date in my resignation letter after November 25th, it means that um, you will appoint somebody to fill my seat until April 2016, which would fill up the rest of my term, um, you know, before it would go back to the public mm -hmm. to be chosen. Um, I guess my personal feeling is the faster that they get to choose who fills the seat, I feel the better. I certainly understand that from a board perspective, it can be a little disconjointed and, and things like that too. But at the same time, Mary, the board could make the decision to um, run as a six member board until um, as well. I mean, those are decisions that could be made, but I feel like the constituents put me here, and I feel like the constituents should put the next person here too. Well, that's and that, my thoughts. That's very important, but the concern is that is it fair to somebody who's willing, or people that are willing to come before the board to make a choice and then in a month decide they have to run for an election when they're just getting their feet wet well, to really know what the operation of the board is. And I wish that Craig was is. here um, to speak to this, but I, I feel like it would be a great, a great glimpse of what could be to come for that person if they chose to run. I don't see that as being mm -hmm. a negative for that individual. I do because they get one meeting. They're going to get roughly an hour and a half, you know, to try to get their arms around. So that's where I, I, I would have to agree to disagree with you on that part of it. So you're looking to move after. <coughs> yeah, because then you get some some cohesiveness going in there. Because I would want to put them in. Correct. That should be the leader. That should be the leader. I think of what I've been. to people's gifts. Now I get it. You know, but like I said, it took about six or twelve months. I do feel that you know, if somebody's appointed and they sit through one meeting there, I mean, they, they hardly know what's going to go on. And maybe it is in all fairness to let them roll out until 2016 and then make that determination to run a campaign potentially. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Tony. I, mean, I feel it's about the same. I think I, I talked to you, Jay, about, about six weeks ago. And I think get it was the term that you used at that time. So I think that's the point. So I guess <coughs> any other input on the timing issue? Positive, negative? I guess with that, Heather, I'll volley it back to you to get back to us. I guess obviously with the timing, so we know what we're going to have to do. Um, I would appreciate you considering the, the thought process of the board as a whole. What's, what's the best direction for the whole district? The whole district. Right? How soon could we be looking at <laughs> in December yet, or by January? Or? I, I would want it because again, about 
to get people right. up to speed, I'd say the sooner the better, because we got a board retreat on January 5th. Well, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah. you got your retreat coming up January. And that's going to be significant. That's going to be some big decision making stuff. Heather and Troy and I met last Monday. Well, this is and the timeline that we kind of hashed out at that time would be to probably put it in the paper for a couple of weeks and then give somebody an opportunity to respond to that. So you'd probably be looking at the end of the month um, as to try to see if anybody actually applies to get on the board. And then like we did in the last time, when this happened a few months ago, we would do the interviewing right before the board meeting on the, on the 8th and then appoint the person on the 8th. December. And it seemed to work out pretty well with with Craig doing it that way. So that was kind of the using what we've done in the past. Well, regardless, kind of when she's going to resign, she's going to resign, so we can. That's what we're going to do, no matter what. Right. That's what I'm saying. We can put it in. It's just a matter of what the time period. I, I think I heard the board say they don't want to run with six. No, we want, we want seven. So we're going to have seven come December 8th, no matter when the, the, it comes in. So that, that's the timeline, unless I hear differently from the board. Right, we're going to have seven. It's just a matter of what their term is going to be, depending on what happens. Correct. It'll either be four months or 16 months. the 30,000 foot view, as Mr. Schmeld likes to call it, um, for what the technology department has been doing. Um, it's Tammy, who, myself, and then we have a service credit team, Garrett Meyer, who helps us out um, as, as part of his schedule of the day. Um, between the three of us, for quarter one, we have closed 884 help desk tickets. And um, the numbers next to the buildings are more their quote, not the number of tickets each one had. Look at the, okay. the pie chart. Wow. I know. I was like, well, that's not going to help out. Um, but yeah, look at the size of the pie. That's a better picture for you. And a better in color. That helps. I was saving some. Um, and then currently we have 65 help desk tickets open. Some of them are um, through working with K-12. That they're, they're bigger issues or beefier issues. We're starting to really dig into some of the, the meat, not the quick fix. So we'll just run over there and hit some buttons and wave our wands and it happens. So we're really digging in, but every day we're making progress and that is very exciting. Um, the other part, just a just general status update. The KHS 408N computing lab was older technology than all the elementary schools. Um, N computing is kind of like a virtual Computing. So if you go into any elementary school, their computer lab, um, KES specifically has the pods, there's no bottom to their computers. It's just a monitor, a keyboard, and a mouse, and there's a little attachment on the back. That technology, K-12 and I are working very hard to keep, and so far it's okay, there's a hiccup here or there, but it, it's sustainable. The technology that was used and installed a few years prior to that was outdated and we could not support it in the 408 lab. So we worked together with Mrs. Dreyer and Mr. Loss, um, shut it down for a month while we were gathering teacher workstations that used, they now have laptops and repurposing those. So now the 408 lab is reopened, um, all with individual computers. Um, we've had a couple of glitches here and there. We fixed them and right now it is back up and running at no cost other than the staff laptop. So that was really exciting for us to be able to turn around. Um, we've been focusing a lot on inventory and organization and making sure we know what we have, hardware, software, where is it, how can we best support it, and things like that. Um, we have started long-range planning with the K-12 Technology Group, looking out through the rest of the school year as well as beyond. How can we best serve the students and staff of the school district? Um, I also have a K-5 and a 612 Technology Group that is currently um, serviced by administrators, um, Andy Mayer, the librarian, serves on both, and then at least one, if not more, representative from each building for K-5 as well as 612. 
Um, and we focus, we try to be good stewards of time, which is why they're currently separate. But as necessary, we will meet K-12 to discuss bigger decisions. And at that point, when we're ready to do some big decision making, we'll probably be contacting some of you guys for some input and things like that. Uh, but those are set. Um, they did a great job planning August PD. We did a day, and then 6-12 did a half, and then an additional half day of nothing but varied conference style professional development. So teachers could really kind of choose what they wanted to learn about. And that was a huge undertaking, and I think it went pretty darn good for our first time attempting some kind of customized professional development for our staff. So now we're regrouping and looking forward. Um, and we're also working with classroom teachers on technology integration, whether it's their websites or um, using different scripts in Google Drive to make their lives a little bit easier, make the formative assessments come and flow a little bit faster. Um, so that is currently what I'm working on as far as classroom. Looking forward, it will be more Tiffany in the classroom, more Garrett and Tammy doing the, the fix it, maintaining stuff. So that's our quarter one update. Any questions? So it's going well. It's not like a good referee. We're not hearing anything. So. Sounds familiar. <laughs> we'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary, policy report. Okay. We last met on October 27th. We have completed um, all the NOLA policies. And uh, I, oh shoot, no, I forgot I have to bring them at home. The last, there are just a few items that um, I ran off copies like I had before for everybody to make the changes in your booklets. There were just a few real minor things. Um, I completed them all, I met with Jim, so that the next um, processes that Richard's coming from Neola on the 18th to meet with you and Tracy to kind of put it in and correct it. So minor kinds of things, it really was good. So we went through everything with a fine piece. That was a lot oh, of time. I, I appreciate everyone's Oh, it was great. In that. Because now it was good. We're in a good spot with the policies. Right. So I will get those to you. There was just a few items like I did before with some, you know, extra words or a spelling word or, you know, some minor kinds of things. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, finance report. Jay, we're all good? You okay? Everybody's got a copy of the. Focus for building grounds. So, you got any questions? We're going to meet on uh, December 8th at 5. We're going to have like an OE meeting, 5 to 6, correct? Right? At the district office. So, we'll have either get them to Doug, get them to me, or get them to Jim. Uh, questions that you have about the plan. I know Mary's dug into it already, so if you have questions. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Looking for a motion to go into closed session. I move to adjourn the closed session. Okay, uh, we will go into closed session in three minutes, giving everyone a chance to disperse.